yes, we are in a series called uh, Work It, uh, which the um, urban dictionary definition is to strut your stuff. So a little bit, we're playing on that a little bit. How do we strut our stuff in the workplace? But on a more serious note, how does our faith deeply inform the way we think about and go about this thing we called work? A couple of caveats for the whole series. Uh, the first one is, what do we mean by work? What, 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 how would I define that? Well, I'm, I'm going to try and include everybody in that. Yes, there's going to be those that work full-time or part-time, um, but I want to include you if you are a student, if you're studying. Um, uh, maybe like Tara, um, stays at home and raises and nurtures our wonderful children. Um, uh, maybe you're retired and maybe you're looking or doing or working on various projects. Maybe you're even busy in retirement than you were when you were working, like my grandpa-in-laws. Uh, um, so really when I say work, I mean what do you spend the most amount of time doing with your week? And that's what I mean by work. It can be defined as anything. Second is an apology from the church, I think. Um, maybe not necessarily this church, but church as a whole, where we maybe have minimised the work of God, God's work, when you're doing kind of God's work as the stuff you do at church. Volunteering, maybe. Uh, maybe in your group. Uh, maybe it's um, telling your friends, inviting people to Alpha. Um, or maybe it's just when you serve the poor. But we want to dispel that myth. Uh, we want to talk about your work. We want to talk about your faith and how that informs how you go about and think about your work. Uh, and uh, last week, we looked at the vision of God. If you haven't seen that talk, you can go and check it out online. Lots of drawings, very interesting PowerPoint presentations, um, where we set down a theological vision of what work is. So God, the first worker who is working to create uh, order, beauty, and benefit uh, for others, not for himself, but for others and especially human beings and made in his image, made in his likeness. We are called into that God work as well to create order, create beauty for the benefit of others. And the Bible invites us into this story of work, it gives us a story, something which has meaning beyond what we just do on the day to day basis, which goes against a worldview of work, which can have us thinking that work is just a means to an end. It's what I do to get by. It's a survival thing. I just earn as much as I can in order to get the things I need and support my family. Uh, but really, it's just a survival thing. And hopefully one day I can earn enough of this stuff called money to detach myself from it completely. And the Bible's story dispels all of those myths. It works against that notion. Um, it puts meaning to what we do with our work. And that's what we're trying to do in our series. Today, we're going to look at the future of work, the future of work. And we're going to ask a couple of questions. The first is, what are we contributing to with our work? And the second is, what is the future we are committing our lives to? This thing we call work that we spend most of our lives doing. And to help us in those questions, I want to paint an image for you. Um, and it's the, one of the things I love about when we move to Five Ways. I don't know uh, how many of you actually live in and around Five Ways, but the best thing about moving to Five Ways um, is free stuff. I've even caught some of you after church who don't live around here, walking the streets of Five Ways just to see what free stuff has been put out. Some good stuff uh, and some pretty bad stuff as well. Mostly what we put out is all the bad stuff around Five Ways. Um, and I'm continually um, hearing Tara coming in the house saying, Johnny, can you help me with something? She's either sending me down the road to carry up a piece of furniture or I'm lugging something out of the car to bring into the house. Now, there's a term we use in our family called toot. Um, and it's, it's, it's kind of, it kind of means junk, kind of means rubbish, and it's a total waste of our time bringing that thing into our house in the first place. There's no potential in that thing that we've bought in. But for Tara, she doesn't see to it. Uh, she sees something else. She sees potential. She sees possibility. She sees value in what I would call a piece of tut, which is beyond itself. I see the current state. She sees a future reality, which is more beautiful. It has more potential. It has more possibilities to it. And we see um, this with furniture. There are websites dedicated to sort of thing. I've got a couple of images for you on the screen. Um, the first is um, old oil drum, piece of tut. To someone else, not a piece of tut. Potential, beauty, order the benefit of others. Um, the next is an old bath. Now, I'm, I'm thinking, there's no way I'm getting in that. That looks disgusting. I might catch something in getting in that. Someone else sees beauty, order, and benefit for others. Uh, next up is an old battered, I think it might be even an old army suitcase. I'm p potentially, I'm willing to push myself to a step to get up to something, um, but someone else sees this. Isn't that awesome? Is that beauty? 
Someone is seeing beauty, order, potential in these things beyond the future reality that they see. They don't all work, by the way. Here's another one. Um, they call this uh, just jeans. It's just called jeans. <laughs> I do actually quite like them. <laughs> um, some see junk. Others, like Tara, maybe you, see beauty, see potential, see value. And this is about mindset. Beauty and potential and value. The way that we see that in something is about mindset. And the Bible talks about this. Our relationship with Jesus kind of grows and nurtures this in us to encourage this kind of mindset in everything that we do, especially our work. Faith in Jesus should open our eyes to what is possible and not what isn't possible. Our work has a value, has a potential beyond itself, even though we can't see it. But in what way? And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to have a look at the Bible. We are going to look at Colossians. Uh, huge apologies to Doug, who is on um, AVs today. There's a, a lot of images and quite a few Bible verses. But we're going to hold hands and we're going to get through it. This is Colossians 3, and it's uh, verses 23 to 24, just short. And I am plucking it out of context, which I apologize about, but it will help us, and you'll see the mastery of it later, I hope. But it says this, whatever you do, Work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Lovely. There's three things I think this passage is looking at. Two of them we're going to look at next week. And those are simply just to say that who we are working for. And Paul seems to suggest that we actually work for God, not the people who pay us. Interesting concept. We'll look at that more next week. And um, the second is that what qualifies as our work? Again, we'll look at that next week. But just to say that from this, Paul seems to think that whatever we do, anything qualifies as work, as the Lord's work. But for the purpose for today, we're going to focus on the third point that this passage brings out is for the purpose of what? What is the purpose to our work? What are we working for? And Paul gives us this image of an inheritance. An inheritance for you and I is, um, hopefully, uh, what I might receive at a future date um, uh, at the cost of somebody else. Property, wealth, is when we get something given to us, handed down from somebody else. And Paul isn't talking about that kind of inheritance. He's borrowing an Old Testament term, an Old Testament image for the promised land, which isn't a vacation because it involves work. But it's a place where Israel, they're free, they're free to work with dignity and with a grace and honour, where they can live in a way that glorifies God, the one who has redeemed them and taken them out of slavery. This term inheritance means it's, um, it's almost like a gift. It's been graced to them. Last week, we talked about the Garden of Eden in the first chapter of Genesis. And this is like a return to the Garden of Eden for them. So remember that image of the Garden of Eden. God and humanity working, co-working together for order, for beauty, and for the benefit of others. This is what Paul is getting at with this image. Co-workers with God. There's an eternal investment in the work that we do. And Paul is borrowing this image of an internal investment. And he's applying it here in this passage. He's applying it to the readers of his letter and he's applying it to us. Seeing our work as an investment, an inheritance for a new world. Our work, therefore, has a future. So what does this mean? Well, think about that picture of the five ways uh, tut that can be turned into something beautiful. It's about seeing value and new possibility with our work. And Paul is urging his readers to see their work. They're seeing everything that they, that they do in a new way as packed with possibility. Your ability to see and imagine something as having a redeemed and restored future is directly connected to how, you, how much value you see in that piece of furniture, how much value we see in our work in the present. The vision of our work is about imagination. And Paul is tapping into this. He's challenging our imaginations, challenging what is possible. He's challenging a stunted imagination 
and what's not possible with our work. Um, He's encouraging a mindset of possibility. Why is he doing this? Well, for Paul, the resurrection changes everything. For him, this is core to everything. And we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 15. It's quite a big chunk, but we're going to race through it at breakneck speed with some PowerPoint pictures to help us sum up what's going on. But it starts with this in verse 1, chapter 15, 1 Corinthians. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom esteem living. You can go and talk to them. Knock on the door and ask them. That's me ad living. Though they have, uh, some have fallen asleep, some have died, they're not with us. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, apostles, and then last, he appeared to me also. What's going on? Paul is talking about a treasure, the treasure of the gospel, which he's received, he's passed on to the people in Corinth. And Paul's issues that they, they seem to have slipped in what they believe. They seem to have reduced their faith to the nice bits about Jesus, the lovely bits, the love, the kindness, the grace, the mercy. But when it comes to the resurrection, it's a bit of a stretch of the imagination. The raising of the dead, it's potentially a step too far for those in Corinth. And Paul is saying that there's a consequence to this. There are consequences to how we view the resurrection. Let's read on. Verse 12. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Now, Paul is not disagreeing. This is hard to imagine. He knows it's hard to imagine. He's just saying that it's central. It's core to the gospel. It's what everything hinges upon. Let's read on. Verse 16. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. Where am I? My bit of paper. There I am. Without the resurrection, the whole thing falls apart. Jesus is just another victim. He's just another dead dude, like many others. It has no meaning. It's not a new story, and it's not good news. What makes the gospel a game changer? What makes it something to reorientate our lives around, to reorientate our work around, is precisely the resurrection. Of what seems inevitable, death is no longer the last word. It's about pushing our imaginations to the limits. Let's read on, verse 20 to 24. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ, the first fruits, we're going to think about that word in a minute. Then when he comes, those who belong to him, then when the end will come, when he hands over the kingdom of God to the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion of authority and power. What's going on here? Okay, we've got some pictures for you. Um, First is a a picture of a couple of balls. Um, uh, This is not what is going on. I'm going to look this way. This is not what's going on, where we've got the earth represented by the blue circle and heaven, the red circle, the physical and the spiritual, where Jesus comes over from the spiritual, spends a bit of time in the physical and gives us an opportunity where we too, we can escape this blue blob and we can go to somewhere else entirely. Um, There's only one problem with this view. 
Um, and that's the Bible. It doesn't say this. It's not what it's teaching us. Um, next slide. What does this mean for our work, this view? Well, it means that if this thing over here is going to be annihilated, is going to be finished, is going to be dead, then anything we do in it, including our work, dies with it. It's got no future. There's no future to this model, and that's not what the Bible is talking about. Next pick. Instead, what we're looking at is, as the Bible taught, taught us last week in Genesis, that heaven and earth are together. It's beautiful unity. There's love. It's co-working with God in tandem with him, creating order, creating beauty, and creating benefit. Next picture, it doesn't stop there. It's about a page and a half into the Bible, and we realize that there's a separation. Human beings take on for themselves. We choose what is right for ourselves. We define what is good and evil for ourselves. We don't allow God to do that for us. So therefore, we, God is pushed out. He's pushed out by us. He doesn't leave. We push him out. But we can't push him out of his creation. It's, he's part of it. So what is Christ? Christ is the kingdom coming. Jesus says the kingdom is coming here now in and through himself, in and through him. And what he's doing is a slow advancing, coming to earth, overwhelming earth with grace and with mercy, dealing with those things we talked about last week, sin. And we use another word, resistance, resistance in our work, like weeds and thorns in everything we do, making everything we do harder, slower, more time, tiring us out. And as the kingdom comes, it's dealing with these things, pushing them out, absorbing them into himself. Next pick. I can't remember where we are now. So, as the heaven and, uh, comes to earth, as it invades earth, when we say that prayer, Lord, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, we are going back to this picture of unity, of intimacy with God, co-working together, creating order, beauty, and benefit for the benefit of others. And this stuff we call sin, resistance, evil, death, maybe even hell, is pushing out. God is not interested in getting you into hell. He's interested in getting hell out of the world and out of you and I. But what does this mean for our work? Next pick. It means simply to say that whatever we do in the blue blob is part of the blue and red blob. Our work has a future. It has potential beyond itself. It has potential into the new realm. Work doesn't die in the Bible. Work continues in the Bible. We don't go to heaven for a vacation. We go to heaven to work. But we work in the way that we were called to work, the way it was meant to be, co-working with God, creating order, beauty, and benefit. Theological lesson over. Let's go to page, verses 50. 57. I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery, and a mystery it is. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. That's an image for Jesus coming again. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised, imperishable, and we all will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable. And the mortal with immortality. There I am. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with the immortal, then the saying that is written has come. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Then he quotes Hosea. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God. He has given us the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. It's beautiful. We are changed. We are transformed. Not death, but transformation. We haven't believed in vain. We haven't lived in vain, and we haven't worked in vain. What's true of Jesus is also true of me. If I cling to him, if I hold on to him, if I can let, some, let go of some of my stuff as well and cling to him, then our lives and our work has a future. This means we're not on a sinking ship. 
means that our work isn't futile. It's a ship in disrepair, big disrepair, but the repair team are coming. What we do now with our work matters. It deeply matters because our work has a future. Verse 58, this is how Paul concludes this part of the letter. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Paul is asking us to stand firm. Let nothing move you and get on with the work. It's an interesting ending. Not go on vacation, chill out, relax, have a wonderful time. He says, give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord. What does that mean? Well, we talked about that passage in Corinthians. So who we work for is God. What we do, what we spend most of our time doing is for him. What qualifies as that work is anything that we do. So whatever we do, is the work of the Lord. It's not church stuff. It's everything that we do. And Paul is, I guess what he's getting at, he's saying there's two modes of thinking about our work. The first, this thing that we spend the majority of our time doing has no future. It's just something we do to survive, to pay the bills. But there is a dead end in that mindset. Or it's the second, which is our work in the Lord, for the Lord is never in vain, that somehow that we can't explain, and I can't explain. A bit like Tara looks at a piece of turt and sees potential. That there has a future. Our work has potential. Our work now has value beyond what we can see. And Paul wants us to foster that mindset, a mindset of possibility, of potential for our work beyond the reality that we experience, and that requires imagination. It requires the kind of imagination that we need in order to believe in something as crazy as the resurrection. How we go about our work matters. It deeply matters. It has eternal potential if it's done for the Lord. It's beautiful, it's radical, but it's not always easy to feel like that and to see our work like that. But it is what we are called to do. So as we hold tighter to Jesus, what's true of him becomes true for us. And Paul describes this process as this Jesus rubbing off on us, becoming more like him. He calls this the fruit of the spirit. That from this relationship that we have with him, through our faith in him, growing in us is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness. I'm thinking of the actions to the song, gentleness, self-control. I don't think we've got an action for that one. And when we bring those things into our workplace, into the thing that we spend most of our time doing, we're doing the Lord's work. The Bible begins with a beautiful picture of humans, humanity and God working together, co-workers, creating order, beauty, benefit. But it also ends there as well. We looked at that last week in the book of Revelation. Heaven and earth reunited. The Garden of Eden has returned, but this time as a city. Revelation describes people bringing the fruit of their labor, the splendor of their work to God. The gates of the city are never shut. All are welcome at all times. God and humanity working in harmony, working in an intimacy once again. A city healed and restored and packed with potential for the benefit of others. Can you imagine a healed and restored Brighton? That's what Paul is tapping into when we think about our work. Healed and restored Brighton. Can you imagine your work? Whatever it is, wherever you do it, healed and restored. Can you imagine a relationship healed and restored? Jesus wants to shift our mindset in our relationship with him. He wants us to imagine what is possible. He wants to imagine these kinds of possibilities with our work. The resurrection is an absolute game changer. Shall we pray? Band, do you want to come up? We're going to take a time of communion um, together as well. Um, Stand with me. Don't leave me hanging. I'm all lonely up here on my own.
Yeah, Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you, Lord, that there is a future, future potential to all we do. Thank you, Lord, that nothing we do is in vain. Thank you, Lord, that we haven't believed in vain. But Lord, we just give the issue to us. That's really hard to believe in. We give you that conundrum this morning and we pray, come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit, would you help us, Lord? Would you stretch our imaginations, Lord, beyond what they are now? Help us to imagine these things restored, healed. And Lord, we ask that you help our imaginations to break through what is impossible. Lord, would you help us to see what you think is possible? Amen. Amen.